Hello, everybody. Chris Gethin here. Welcome to another episode of the Knowledge and Mileage podcast. Today, I have Alex Tarnava with me, joining me. If you are viewing this on YouTube, you can actually see I've got Alex here from Vancouver. Thank you very much for joining me here. No problem. Glad to be here. So uh, we started uh, talking probably a couple of months ago now uh, because I'd been taking uh, hydrogen-rich water for quite a while. And then I got introduced to you and I had some conversations with you. I started using your product, which I absolutely love, by the way. And based on, you know, there's a, there's a lot of evidence on hydrogen rich water that I really want to get into today because a lot of my listeners and viewers are really into obviously improving their performance. There's various aspects that I know that hydrogen rich water uh, can help and assist improve performance, et cetera. But obviously you are the guy and the brains behind that that can better articulate it than I can. So, you know, I, first of all, let's, let's, let's go to the beginning because that's always a good place to start. How on earth did you discover hydrogen rich water in the first place? So out of desperation is the best way to put it. You know, I, I had another business um, that was, uh, you know, very successful or relatively successful, depending on who you are and listening. And uh, it allowed me a lot of free time. Um, so when I wasn't traveling on business, um, I only worked an hour or two a day. And the rest of my time, I was training. You know, so I was training at least eight hours a day. Um, I was training in uh, various martial arts, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, boxing, wrestling. And I was competing um, just regionally in uh, CrossFit. So that's a lot of hammering on the body, you know? Um, and, uh, I was at the, the peak of my physical fitness, um, just training so much. I didn't have any off days An off day for me was going and running wind sprints, you know, for an hour at the track and then maybe going for a low intensity hike. Um, and I was training for a CrossFit competition and I got uh, really sick and my best friend did too, and he was training for a triathlon, and he's a, a competitive, or he was back then a competitive, um, you know, triathlete and, you know, Spartan races, stuff like that. He top five, you know, in, in various runs of those. He's a guy who, you know, ran a 34 minute 10K at the end of a triathlon, right? So right. he was very fit. Um, we both got sick at the exact same time, and it hit us in very, very different ways. For me, I had sudden onset narcolepsy. I was sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day. If I wasn't getting up and moving, um, I was falling asleep after sitting on the couch for a minute or two. And I had uh, basically you know, central nervous system shutdown. So my heavy lifts weren't changed. I was still deadlifting like 500 pounds, but I couldn't jump on a box. Like I couldn't even actually jump on a plate, you know? Um, my chin-ups weren't affected, but uh, I couldn't even do a chest-to-bar, you know, and a month before that, I, I could string together, you know, 15 plus bar muscle-ups in a row. So I had no explosive power whatsoever, right? So that's, you know, my deadlift actually didn't change, but I had no explosive movement. Right. Okay. Um, and when they were doing my blood tests, my uh, C-reactive proteins was, was 34, I forget. I think it's like milligrams a, a liter or something like that. Um, the healthy range is below three. So my inflammatory markers were 11 times the high end of normal. I was severely anemic, right? Despite having an 8,000 calorie a day diet, rich in, you know, green vegetables and, and you know, meat protein. So it was uh, very, very peculiar. Um, and my best friend, he developed pneumonia. And actually, you know, had to miss a few weeks of work and go to the hospital several times with pneumonia. So they don't know what kind of virus we had or what, you know, messed us up. But still, still, still to this day, have no idea what caused that. No, no. What, you know, were you both like swimming together, going to the well, same we were gym? Roommates. We were roommates. Wow. Okay. You know, so, and we cooked that a lot of our meals together, right? Because we were both, you know, training similar amounts. Um, but... Uh, when it finally ran its course, um, I, I dropped from like 34 CRP to below two, you know, in the matter of a three-day blood test. So something just ran its course. 
Um, but when it ran its course, I woke up and my body had become like the Tin Man. You know, so I had no mobility. Um, I used to have very, very good, you know, mobility. Um, I prided myself on it. You know, I could say throw a head kick while I was moving backwards, right? Um, I played rubber guard on my left side. I developed arthritis in my left hip. I couldn't even do a butterfly on the ground, you know, when a couple months before I could touch my ankle to my face. Um, and uh, my shoulder was frozen. Did this have any effects like on your internal organs, like your liver enzymes? Did they, did they increase? They didn't test that stuff. I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, what happened next is, you know, when they did all the imaging, they, they realized I developed arthritis in numerous spots, um, worst of which was my left shoulder. Um, you know, it was moderate to advanced osteoarthritis, basically overnight. Um, so I went on a thousand milligrams of naproxen a day. So that's like a leave, but it was a, a prescription strength you know, a leave. And um, I started getting, uh, um, you know, cortisone injections into my shoulder after a couple of months. I kept on, um, I stopped um, training martial arts because it was just too repetitive, too hard on my shoulder. My hips were, you know, seized, you know, it was just too tough on my body. But I tried to continue um, training CrossFit. You know, I, I think I did like two really small competitions after that, you know, a team one and another one before I just threw in the towel because um, I just had no overhead mobility or anything like that. But um, it was only after several months that uh, I uh, developed um, numerous ulcers from the naproxen, right? So I had to stop and uh, basically my shoulder froze overnight. And around that time, like I had also been looking in to other ways to, you know, um, regulate my inflammatory response and I bought a hydrogen water machine, a water ionizer, and I didn't know if it was working or not, but when I stopped the naproxen, I sure knew it wasn't working, you know? So that was kind of disheartening. I went back to PubMed and started scouring research again and hydrogen kept coming up, hydrogen water kept coming up and I just got really frustrated. Why is this machine not working? And I, it just dawned on me, how do I even know there's hydrogen in the water? coming right. out of the machine. Yeah. So I found a, a test kit and it had no detectable hydrogen. I sent the machine in to get a deep clean because that's what the company said, oh, you need a deep clean. It came back, there was still no measurable hydrogen. I had to triple the input to reduce one drop. So it was like 0 0.03 parts per million of hydrogen coming out of this $5,000 machine. Um, so rather than, you know, being upset and giving up and feeling ripped off, I actually got excited and I said, okay, so hydrogen still could work. I'm not getting hydrogen right now. And I started buying all the full studies to see how are the research scientists making hydrogen and magnesium kept on popping. Right. So, uh, I'm a bit of an autodidact. I'm self-taught in a lot of areas. I knew enough you know, about chemistry and spent a little time reading. And I went to hell and back to get all the ingredients required, you know, dealing with China, dealing with Russia, you know, getting some stuff, you know, basically smuggled in, right, to start experimenting, making um, my own tablets. But then after a while, when I started taking them, um, I just had a, a bit of a, a sober second thought. And I thought, you know, am I going to be an example of, of like Dunning Kruger here and win a Darwin Award? Am I going to kill myself? Right. Because I think I know more than I do. And I found my founding partner, Dr. Holland. Um, so he's a PhD medicinal chemist. And I, I basically asked him to look over what I was doing. Right. And help me out. At first, um, he basically called it the worst pseudoscience, you know, he's ever heard in his life. And he, he's from, you know, England also. Right. So he was a little snarky, you know, in yeah. saying it basically, you know, I've saved you some money. Don't waste your time, you know, told me off. And I, I said, Hey, I, you know, I get the skepticism. I sent him a bunch of the better, you know, controlled studies. And he got back to me, you know, a week or two later and said, you know, it looks like there's enough evidence to pursue this as a supplement. Sure. You know, I'll take a look. And I kept on just sending him a new study every you know, day as he was working on it. 
And it was just by chance because it, it wasn't what he listed on, on his resume as his background that uh, I sent him the study on, on Hep B. And it's what he was currently in charge of at his pharmaceutical company was working on a cure for Hep B, which I think is through phase three trials now. Um, he's head of creative for a pharmaceutical company. And he called me for lunch and just said, uh, listen, all the other studies, I, I have to accept the findings of the researchers because it's not my specialty. But, you know, unless this is frauded, you know, this works. This stuff works, right? Are you looking to commercialize this? Are you looking for a partner? And I was on the fence throughout that whole time. Um, I was thinking, you know, this could be my new career path. I'm passionate. I'm excited about this. Nobody's doing it, you know, in North America right now. It's non-existent. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, who am I to develop something like this when I had no background? in the area, even though, you know, I've innovated on other products and, you know, businesses and such, um, this was getting into health. So having him want to join the company kind of gave me a confidence boost and say, okay, let's do this. I'll figure out the business side, you know, and we'll make sure we do it right from the science side. So from there, it was uh, three weeks to refine our formulation on the bench tests. And then we realized when we scale up, everything changes. And right. it took like 2,000 iterative adjustments, 15 failed scale-up attempts, and a year of R&D to get our first production-ready tablet. Since then, we have a couple thousand more, you know, in a few years in production, constantly just refining how everything works and, you know, going through. And, and, here, to better and better. here we are. We have a commercialized product. Yeah. So, so it's, it's called Drink... HRW, which is hydrogen rich water. That's a, that's the name of the company, correct? Yeah. So that that's um, you know that that's our brand. You know, and uh, you know we manufacture basically worldwide for all, all sorts of other brands too. It is our you know IP. Um, that's what we've done is we invented how to get this hydrogen in in the open vessel without needing external pressurization, um, and it's all our clinical trials too. Right. right? So um, I believe you know it. Products like this, hydrogen brand new, it needs hundreds of voices to tell the story. And hydrogen has so many benefits because of how it works. You know, it works in the same way that exercise does. You know, so I mean, exercise is recommended in a protocol for almost everything, right? To improve your exercise. You know, hydrogen works on a lot of the same biological pathways and actually potentiates exercise while mitigating some of the damages. So that story can get a little bit complicated so, you know, we deal with so many people because we know how important hydrogen can be for so many communities. And we like talking about how it works for each individual area, you know, and partnering with the right people and great people that can get out an honest and accurate message. Right. Okay. Got it. And it, it's funny how we actually got in contact with each other because you obviously had um, a, a ne not a negative effect, but, um, uh, you know, your first introduction to hydrogen rich water was with a machine, didn't really work for you. And unfortunately, I'd invested into a machine. And uh, unfortunately, that company turned out to be not very good either. You know, and, I, yeah. and I'd invested quite a lot there. So when I re reached out to you, you know, you didn't try to sell me on your product at all. You said, well, you know, we do make it for all these other companies, I can put you uh, in, in that direction. And I appreciate that. Now, when I started drinking the hydrogen rich water first myself like I, I didn't have any issues with arthritis or you know I didn't have my shoulder surgery at that time I started taking it uh, way before then but I found that this the stress that I'd say that I usually feel in my joints in my connective tissue from training because I was at the time I was participating in uh, Ironman triathlon and bodybuilding and getting ready for an ultra marathon and all this stuff. And it's a lot of stress. And that, that's so crazy. I mean, it's so impressive because most people don't get how opposite those goals are. Yeah. You, you know, um, to do ultra marathons and, and you know, Ironmans and be bodybuilding, you know, it's so polar opposite in your body that you're actually performing so high. It's the same thing when I try and explain CrossFit. People are like, oh, you're almost up there with the leaders. I'm like, no, because it would take me a year of effort to get this one category up here. And then it would take away from every other 
area because you you lose out so when things seem close it's actually a world away yeah yeah it is it certainly is and not just physically but mentally as well because it's you know one is very hard and intense for a short period of time and then you have to kind of lower your heart rate and you know get comfortable being uncomfortable for a long amount of time you know in, in, in another form especially if you've just come from one sport uh, for like 20 years and then you make this transition to, to, to do both and you know what one of the things that I had to do was to kind of knock out a lot of the inflammation that I found through a lot of uh, ice and cold thermogenesis and cryotherapy but when I started drinking uh, the hydrogen rich water I, I, I found that I was able to remove myself a lot of that inflammation and I felt that I had more mental clarity whether that was a placebo I have no idea maybe that's something that you can expand upon uh, yeah. in, in regards to not only the physical aspects but the mental aspects particularly for people you know my listeners my viewers uh, are active individuals for sure so I mean um I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some research and I'll touch on some of my own experience, right? Um, first off, basically in my experience, like hydrogen, it, it hasn't regrown my joint, you know, like um, I just had my own shoulder surgery. I, I had, uh, you know, I'm advanced osteoarthritis. I had a full labral tear and a rotator cuff tear, right? So right. I'm on that, my, you know, my own shoulder surgery. But what hydrogen did for me is it allowed me to sleep at night and I, I quit you know, naproxen and anti-inflammatories. So, you know, I still feel the arthritis in my various joints. I've got arthritis in like eight spots, but I can sleep at night. I can sleep through the night and I can still work out, you know, a little okay. bit. Like, with, with your sleep, you weren't sleeping before because you just had uh, sleep issues or was just, it because of the pain? Every, the pain. Every time I turn on my shoulder, I would wake up. Right. right. Or I'd end up on my shoulder and my shoulder was frozen and then I'd wake up and then I couldn't fall back to sleep because, you know, it's throbbing, throbbing in pain. I, I've always had sleep issues also. Um, interestingly, we, we do have uh, some sleep studies, you know, starting up at two major North American universities. Um, I just went over the animal care protocol at, at the one in Canada uh, last week and I'm flying um, first couple of days in October to deal with, you know, a major university in, in California that's finalizing their protocol. So there's a lot of researchers that think hydrogen are going to help on, on sleep also on top of the indirect benefits of, of say reducing discomfort to, that help me for pain. So how, um, how, how is that working? Sorry to interrupt you. How does that actually work? Because if it's, you know, removing yourself of a lot of the discomfort, I can only imagine it's somehow on a cellular level helping with recovery, restoration. It, it is, you know, and there's a lot of um, athletic, you know, studies that show hydrogen not only uh, doesn't negatively impact exercise, but it potentiates the benefit. So a lot of athletes, you know, a lot of bodybuilders don't take antioxidants because of the research showing that antioxidants blunt the benefits from exercise. The, the hormetic response, yeah. Exactly. So hydrogen is actually a hormetic agent, right? It, it works in the same way exercise does. It is not a direct antioxidant. And one of the things that I have so strongly tried to shout from the rooftop, but a lot of the marketers just don't listen because they don't understand it is hydrogen is actually a pro oxidative stress that triggers a greater endogenous antioxidant response, right? So exercise and it's the same thing, you know, for, you know, um, lowering inflammatory cytokines, hydrogen doesn't, isn't an antioxidant and it's not an anti-inflammatory. It regulates our redox status of our cells and regulates production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we have a healthy inflammatory response. Got it. Very, very different things, right? Because we need inflammation. Inflammation is good. That's our body's defense mechanism over a lot of things. Um, you don't want to suppress inflammation all the time, right? Yeah. Need short, short, short term inflammation is good, but long term. You know, exactly, bad. right? Actually, exercise works by increasing oxidative stress and increasing inflammation, right? So when you work out, you're increasing oxidative stress, which actually triggers your body to produce more of our endogenous antioxidants like glutathione, superoxide, dismutase, catalase. And it's the same thing for inflammation. You know, when you work out, uh, our, our skeletal you know, tissue releases interleukin-6, which is one of the most damaging pro-inflammatory cytokines. But when excreted in small amounts from our skeletal tissue, it acts as a myokine role. 
and it triggers interleukin 10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So we have a net anti-inflammatory response from exercise, right? Even though it starts with the small pro-inflammatory trigger, right? So hydrogen, say with our redox status, there was a really cool study out of Brazil that, that really painted this picture is they had um, hydrogen being administered to rats in, in a physical stress test. And it showed that actually while they were working out, their oxidative stress increased, right? So they had more oxidative stress than the control group that was just, you know, exercising to failure. Right. But their redox balanced quicker than the control group. So the endogenous antioxidant response happened faster and they recovered faster. Got it. That makes you know? sense. And um, with our trials, there, there's been some really interesting stuff happening in our trials. Our first, um, it was mid-aged overweight women. And at the end of 28 days, and this was double blind placebo controlled crossover. So both groups did hydrogen and placebo, and then they switched, right? And it was double blinded everywhere. And there was like an 8% improvement in VO2 max, like 50% improvement in time to exhaustion and work completed. And, you know, in talking to those researchers, uh, they're on the same page I am. It doesn't immediately improve your VO2 max, but the women were working out longer and harder and recovering quicker, right? So in the 28 days, they made leaps and bounds in improvement, right? Because it's like you're doing the same workout, but it's increased your damage and then sped up your recovery. So it's potentiating your train, right? Oh, because yeah. exercise is just acting like a booster on, or sorry, hydrogen's acting like a booster onto the exercise you're doing. And then yeah. it's speeding up the recovery. Yeah. Um, and then our second trial was just a single dose with young, fit, you know, athletic participants. And it was a VO2 max stress test. We didn't expect to see any improvement in VO2 max after a single dose. But something that we saw was really cool. From minutes one to nine in submaximal, you know, exercise, and the average failure was about 13 minutes, if I recall correctly, it lowered the heart rate by five to six beats per minute while keeping the oxygen they pulled in the same. So the hydrogen group, and this was again, they did a baseline placebo and hydrogen and then did a crossover with 20 participants in Utah. Um, and so the hydrogen group, they pulled in the same oxygen, but their hearts were beating a lot slower, which is gonna be very big for repeated bout athletes, endurance athletes. Yeah, that's your, a good your, thing. You know, exactly. Um, and then even talk, getting into recovery, right? Um, Topically, you know, we're, we're doing some research right now. We have, uh, you know, a pair of case studies that were done in pro soccer players in Europe um, in hydrogen baths opposed to, you know, rice, rest, dice, compress, elevate, uh, and, and uh, for grade two ankle tears. And anecdotally, the results are phenomenal. From the case studies, the results are phenomenal. And we have a full randomized controlled trial starting this fall, right, directly comparing hydrogen to rice because the researchers believe that it's probably going to be bad, right? Because ice actually blocks, you know, the inflammation and we, we need to regulate, you know, the inflammation and uh, for healing um, and hydrogen actually increases blood plasma flow too, right? So it's regulating the inflammatory response, maybe even better than ice does, but also speeding up healing. Yeah, for sure. So, so that would, because it's increasing the blood flow, so it had help assist carry nutrients to the area to assist with the recovery. Uh, you know, for, for instance, like if you've got scar tissue, you need to get, promote the blood flow to that area without yeah. causing swelling or anything like that. It's funny. I was with Lyd Hamilton uh, last week at his home and he honestly, uh, my really, sister's in love with him. Oh, really? Yeah. I think a lot of people are. She had a, a photo actually like a year ago. My sister's a surfer. And right. uh, it was one of the ones I, one of the first ones I think on our Instagram page is she took a, a photo with him and, and, you know, his wife, Gabby Reese, I think her name is. Yeah. Gabby. With the rejuvenation, you know, oh, drink HRW awesome. rejuvenation tablets. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah. Well, I was at their place last week and uh, we did the hot and cold thermogenesis uh, yeah. out there. And he honestly believes that heat has a better response to, uh, uh, to recovery than ice does because he feel it feels that ice of course it is needed in certain circumstances but a lot of the time it isn't as much you know let, let's say after after a triathlon 
or something yeah. like that, where he actually prefers heat over the ice mm -hmm. because we always seek ice thinking, okay, I just, I just, yeah, I just want to be numbed from this pain, yeah. from this uncomfortability. But like you said, there's a hormetic response behind the heat that can actually improve recovery with the heat shock proteins and stuff like that. And if you can actually promote that in a certain unrelated way through uh, hydrogen rich water, that, that, that's got to be a good thing. And, and to me, I, I see um, the various modes of hormesis as the best tool we have right for our health span for longevity oh, I, you know, I practice it every day i love it you know exercise you know cold therapy heat therapy fasting you know i fast every every week um it, you know and then even uh even ethanol right you know as long as you you don't overdo it like i, I drink a glass or two of red wine a day and it's a bit uh um not socially accepted but i always say drink it like for lunch Drink your wine for lunch because then you're getting the hormetic response, you're activating your lymphatic system, but you're not impairing your sleep. Most people drink alcohol right before bed, which impacts your REM sleep. Exactly. So if you drink it, you know, lunch early afternoon, it's cleared your system. You know, you keep it in, in low doses. And this is actually what excites me most about hydrogen is various forms of hormesis all operate on a J or a reverse J curve, right? So it starts off, you know, say no benefit, or if you don't do it, you know, you're actually impaired. And then as you increase it, you get benefits. But if you overdo it, it falls off a plateau. You know, like even training, you know, um, you, you work out an hour a day or even, you know, maybe six hours a day, depending on the person. Or, or say if you're elderly, if you work out an hour a day, that could be too much, right? It depends on your body, your, your health at that moment. But, you know, then uh, an exercise is a very long plateau right? Where it's still in the healthy range. But for people who say work out 12 hours a day, seven days a week and never take a break, they go into a chronic disease state, right? Because they're never recovering. They're never allowing that recovery. So hydrogen, actually, we do not know when it's toxic yet. And in fact, um, from what we know about using hydrogen in, in mixed gas, deep sea diving, where it takes more hydrogen to um, create a narcotic-like effect than nitrogen, you know, which is 78% of what we're breathing. Um, that's impossible to do in a commercial product, you know, especially in water, which shows to be the most effective route, you know, for hydrogen therapy. So, so far in the research, the more hydrogen we're giving to people, the better the response, the higher the concentration, the higher do the dosage, the more benefits, you know, studies are seeing. And even in vitro, we see this all the way up to pass saturation of a hydrogen rich medium. Now, to get that in a human body, that means every cell in your body would have to be beyond saturation with hydrogen gas, which is impossible, right? You can't do that. But in the Petri dishes in vitro, they see a dose dependent response as high as they can go in the medium. And it's the same thing in the human research, the higher we went, the better the responses. So hydrogen, we, we don't have this, this cliff where it's bad for you, but also with, with at least exercise and um, there's a lot of, of thoughts and a lot of groups that are using it during fasting, it not only seems to not deter against other forms of hormesis, it seems to potentiate the benefits and it seems to mitigate their damages, right? So if you're overtraining, hydrogen helps you recover, right? So you can work out longer and harder without going into that, you know, chronic disease state because you're not recovering enough, mm -hmm. right? So e even with alcohol, there's a, a study that it, it improved, you know, liver detox enzymes, right? And, really? and anecdotally, um, most of our customers have experienced that when you take hydrogen, you know, while you're maybe drinking a little bit too much and then in the morning, it dramatically cuts the hangover. Really? Okay. Has there been any studies to show, you know, I, I mentioned about liver enzymes before, you know, any liver inflammation or re reduction? Have any of those studies been conducted as yet? So um, we didn't uh, measure uh, inflammation in this model, but our third clinical trial was on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you know, which one in three North Americans have, you know, Western Europeans also um, really, really rampant in Southeast Asia as well. You know, it's becoming an epidemic. And in 28 days, um, it, it was uh, a reduction of about 10% in AST, the one liver enzyme, you know, associated with uh, damage 
in high amounts. Um, it was a significant, clinically significant reduction in the liver fat. And then they did a secondary analysis on the group with uh, HOMA2, which is a gold standard, you know, for insulin sensitivity. They found in the 28 days, it improved insulin sensitivity, sensitivity by 11%. Wow, unbelievable. And was this group fasting or anything like that? Or were they just following nope. a typical? They were, they were an obese population, right? Interesting. So, you know, with no lifestyle changes, it, it improved all these markers. Uh, now, I can talk a little bit about the data because now it was actually it's public. It was presented at two conferences in August. Um, it's not published yet. So I, I know it's going through peer review, I believe, right now. But our fourth clinical trial was... Uh, 60 participants, six months, again, double blind placebo controlled. That's on metabolic syndrome, right? So again, one in three North Americans have metabolic syndrome. It's often called prediabetes. Um, a lot of the research coming out is saying that uh, NAFLD, fatty liver disease, and metabolic syndrome could be one and the same. They're different expressions of the same, you know, issue. It's these supposed lifestyle issues from, you know, uh, poor diet, lack of exercise, you know, that, that cause all these issues. Um, and, uh, you know, the good thing uh, with, with, you know, um, metabolic syndrome and NAFLD is they're reversible. And even by the FDA, you know, metabolic syndrome is a reversible condition, right? Uh, you know, it's not a disease state, right? So that that's, you know, good that they acknowledge that. So we saw improvements across the board in this metabolic syndrome study. So all they did was... They had a, the hydrogen group, and then the, you know, in all of our studies, the placebo group is a magnesium tablet that makes CO2 effervescent with the same amount of magnesium. So nobody knows the difference between the two tablets, and you're getting the same dose of magnesium to, to control for that variable. Well, the metabolic syndrome group lost weight significantly, right? Whereas the, the placebo group gained weight, right? It improved their BMI, their waist, waist to hip ratio. Um, it, it raised their HDL cholesterol. It pretty dramatically lowered their, their VLDL, their very low density lipoproteins, right? Which is really bad for cholesterol. Lowered their triglycerides. Their fasting glu blood glucose went from something like 126 to 102, and it raised in the placebo group. Um, it lowered CRP and, you know, the cytokines like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. Um, and it... it uh, you know, benefited like um, the lipid peroxidation, like NDA T bars, the conjugates. Um, but it also like raised like serum levels of like nitrites and vitamin E and vitamin C. You know, wow. so their body were, was less depleted from a lot of these things. Yeah. So it was really, really, you know, startlingly good data. And it was, again, the highest dose that's ever been given in a clinical trial in water. So it was uh, three tablets a day, right? So each tablet gives about five milligrams of H2. So it was by a 50% margin, the highest dose that had ever been administered. And that was above our previous, you know, clinical trials, unlike, you know, NAPLD and, and the VO2 max one, which were like 10 milligrams a day, which was again, the highest dose ever given, you know, in, in studies. Got so it. it's just, again, further validating what we see, you know, in in vitro that the higher the dose the more the benefits right okay so in regards to the dosing as well because there's a lot of uh companies out there and there's a lot of brands out there like the dosage that you have within like let's for instance with uh your your drink hrw and obviously the the other companies out there that you provide it to can you give us an uh, an idea of what that looks like in comparison to other products out there that market themselves as having hydrogen rich water and, yeah. and, and, and touching on as well that yours being the only legal supplement that is for available sure. for sure and, and there is one brand um, of ready to drink that has grass status you know for their process they actually don't have very much hydrogen in there you know they're they're well below the therapeutic dosage but at least they filed with the fda um so we're the only uh you know, supplement in, you know, the United States and, you know, throughout the world, I believe, that has legally filed, you know, the ingredients needed to make the hydrogen rich water. We have new dietary ingredient status, which is the gold standard of U.S. regulatory in supplements. Um, estimates are as low as 4% of supplements, you know, qualify as NDI, 
mm -hmm. status. Yeah. You know, most would be considered, you know, adulterated because they haven't filed their processes with the FDA. So it took us a, a few years to put this together. Um, massive submission to show all the safety, you know, all the research, every single, you know, protocol we have in manufacturing to show not just that our product's safe, but how we're making it is safe, you know, no contamination throughout. Um, but on top of that, a lot of companies just get on the bandwagon and start marketing hydrogen water, even if they have no hydrogen in the water, right, or not therapeutic. Um, the Japanese uh, government uh, a couple of years ago actually evaluated, I think it was 19 products, right, and issued a, a public warning saying that 17 of 19 companies marketing hydrogen water were below the therapeutic dosage, right, or had no hydrogen, you know, in the water itself. Um, and it was, like I said, with the machine that I bought for five grand, it was making less than 0.1 ppm. Now I've tested other machines, depending on the source water, it can maybe get 0.5 ppm, maybe 0.1, you know, in a lot of coastal cities, like, you know, throughout Vancouver, you know, uh, Seattle, because it's low TDS um, solids in the water. Um, so we get about 10 ppm in the tablets. So to drink a half a liter of that ionized water, um, or the half liter that our tablet goes in, our dose is 100 times higher. Right. Wow. And it's the same with a lot of the pouches you see, um, a lot of the ready to drinks that maybe cost like three, four or five dollars a pouch. They're often like 200 milliliters of water and maybe like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ppm of hydrogen. So in, in a, a, a dosage, you know, manner, we're giving 30 times higher a dose. And that's in one tablet? One tablet. Yeah. So a tablet's about a buck. Right. And you get 30 times a dose uh, of a lot of these companies selling it on store shelves in a pouch that costs like four bucks. And so it's a pretty big differential in, in dosage and value. Um, plus you're getting the magnesium with the tablet because yeah. the magnesium becomes very bioavailable. Uh, first our, our, you know, active magnesium reacts with the water and it makes um, hydrogen gas and magnesium hydroxide, which is milk of magnesia. But then because hydroxide is a function of pH, our uh, buffering acids that we use to facilitate the reaction uh, neutralize the hydroxide and it's just left with um, magnesium ions in suspension of the water. So we get something like nine, over 90% of the magnesium becomes free ions in the water, which is exactly what your body needs to take in. And magnesium supplements have very low bioavailability typically because they're very strong compounds and to absorb a mineral, our stomach acid has to break it apart from whatever it's attached to. Like if you take a magnesium oxide supplement, your stomach acid has to break the oxide off the magnesium. The way we're making hydrogen, to make the hydrogen, the work is done. It's already detached, right? So you, you take it in, in the free form that your body needs. Right. Okay. Is this one of the reasons why you would suggest taking this maybe before uh, sleep, before bed, uh, to help you relax or actually putting it in the bath? Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of people like do do take it before bed. Um, I'd say play around with it. I like taking it first thing in the morning because it really picks me up with energy. I find I get more energy from chugging down my hydrogen water um, than you know a, a coffee or you know I, I don't drink coffee much anymore. I just take straight caffeine pills to control my dosage because you know coffee varies so widely in how much caffeine. Yeah. Um, days I work out, I actually drop my my tablets right in with creatine you know oh you mix them um, together yeah right. um, you know a couple of researchers think that there could actually be a synergistic effect you know with you know creatine and, and hydrogen i have a couple of talks one with uh, professor osich who's done a couple of our, our trials and his big biggest area of research uh, hydrogen is actually moving to number one but it was creatine he's been a creatine researcher for years right and, and he thinks there's a synergistic effect I talked with uh, Tyler LeBaron, the, the leading hydrogen research and researcher in North America, and he was thinking about it, and he's actually published you know, a study on creatine as well. Uh, he, he thinks that there could be something there too, in a synergistic effect. Interesting. So I, I do that just days when I train. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there is synergy, but some of the researchers seem to think so. Um, other days, I'll, I'll chuck it down. But once every few months, I'll change up my dosing and my protocol, 
you know, if hydrogen, you know, is working like hormesis, just like exercise, you don't want to do the exact same exercise every day, right? So for a few months, maybe I'll take it in the evening. The next few months, I take it first thing in the morning, right? You know, then I'll change it up. Say if I'm working out mid-afternoon, I'll start taking it right before the workout. And I'll just change up my dosing protocol to keep my body guessing. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Well, I pretty much take it uh, uh, probably about an hour before my workouts. I've never mixed it with any other supplements. Uh, I've just had it by itself. And uh, I'll just take uh, the, the two tablets. Would yeah. you say that's enough of a dosage for someone like me? Like, is it weight dependent or anything like that? I'm 220 pounds. But that's what I found has seemed to be the sweet spot. Or would you suggest take it a couple of times a day? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. We're still establishing doses and we know that it is dose dependent. The more you get, the better the response seems to be. Um, for me, I've noticed a benefit up to six to eight a day, right? In, in quick succession, I try and blast my body with it. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed no benefit after that, just a heavy laxative effect from more magnesium. magnesium yeah. So you want to you know, make sure that uh, you're not getting in too much magnesium in the day too. If you're taking a lot of tablets, don't take magnesium supplements. You know, it's going to be a laxative effect. Um, whereas, uh, you know, my uh, common law, you know, girlfriend, spouse, um, she runs, like I was saying, marathons, triathlons. She gets hip impingement, which is common in female runners. And she finds like one a day or even one every other day gets rid of her hip impingement, right? Uh, for me, if I only take one a day, my shoulder starts freezing again. You know, I need two or three to unfreeze my shoulder. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, and anything over that is going to be more performance based then. Yeah. Like for instance, um, I'm definitely a responder to hydrogen. Like when I'll go and do cardio, um, if I take like five tablets, like in quick succession, right before I do cardio, like I'm talking five, 10 minutes before the same exercise that'll usually get me to a 155, 160 heart rate. I don't break 130. Right. Interesting. You know, okay. Which it is a, 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 a massive difference from what we saw, you know, in the study, it was like five, six beats a minute lowering. But again, I'm taking, you know, five, six times a dose and I'm a responder. You know, right. there, there seems to be just like creatine and caffeine. There seems to be responders and non-responders to hydrogen. Right. And we're trying to figure out why. Um, most of the researchers agree about 80% of people are responders that they see very clear benefits, you know, through, through biomarkers, but about 20% of people they're calling super responders, right? That very much benefit and get noticeable immediate results. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. So back to me, would you suggest that I continue to take them, you know, before my, uh, about to, you know, an hour before my workout and maybe do a dose before that in the morning, first thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd give that a try. You're a big guy, right? You know, you have more cell, you know, you have more, you know, maybe not more cells, but you, you have more body, right? That the hydrogen needs to diffuse through. Uh, and to touch on what you were saying too, yeah, the, the magnesium was another big reason why you, you'd use it in a bath too, is hydrogen transdermal and so is magnesium. Right? That's how Epsom salts work to relax your muscles. So when you drop tablets in a bathtub, right, you're getting the hydrogen through your skin, right to your sore muscles and joints, plus you're getting the magnesium. Okay, you know, got it. And I guess it's going to be dependent on how much body of water is going to be in the bath is dependent on how many tablets you uh, dump in there too. Exactly. And there are bath tablets too. I sent you some. You yeah, know, yeah. I got those. I got those. Said, you know, do, um, there's some, you know, other brands we've made for, for the bath tablets they are going to be on our site, you know, really soon right yeah. now also. Um, and, uh, I'll have a hydrogen bath once a week. You know, I like, again, and the days that I have a hydrogen path, I usually skip water just to, again, switch up my dosing, right. right. To take it transdermally, you know, instead of drinking it. Okay, perfect. I'll try that as well. I'll try that. And I have been measuring my sleep, which definitely has improved. I've been kind of cycling it. I've been doing like a one on, one off, one on, one off. And on those other days, I've been like trying with CBD, for instance. And yeah. uh, I quantify my sleep. Usually I've got my aura ring on, but I've actually got what's called a bio strap. Uh, you got one. I got my aura ring. You're, yeah. in, the, you're in the aura, aura ring gang. That's awesome. 
So uh, I'm actually trying this bio strap at the moment. I just started uh, trying it out this week. So I'm quantifying my sleep and I have known, I have uh, definitely noticed uh, a big improvement with sleep quality because uh, I was in a sleep clinic in uh, like 2015 because uh, I was sleeping three hours a night. Uh, yeah. So I've doubled that since then, but not just the length, the duration, but the quality of the sleep there as We're well. We're in a very similar situation there. When I got my aura ring, I was averaging, you know, four hours of sleep a night. And I still will wake up after three, four hours every night. And I'm wearing my aura ring to force myself to go back to sleep, to try and get six to seven Hours. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. exactly the same. Yeah, I, I, I use it as my personal trainer, my quantification to ensure that I get to bed at a certain yeah. time and do whatever I can with my hygiene to improve that quality. Yeah, exactly. My, my sleep quality is actually, it's always amazing. You know, and when I sleep three or four hours, I have like no light, light sleep. You know, it's like all deep, you know, and REM sleep, basically. But um there's just so much good research coming out on, on the importance of sleep. And even if you feel fine sleeping three, four hours a night, it's probably doing damage, you know, to your health and, and doing all this stuff. And uh, I've just noticed by forcing myself back to sleep, uh, I'm still getting as much work done. I used to feel like I wish that I, I had a pill to keep me up 24 hours a day so I could be more productive, get, more done so when i'd wake up after three four hours i just get up and start my day and start working um since i've been forcing myself back to sleep um i have had no loss in actual output yeah. you know in performance and, and work and i feel better yeah, yeah my mind sure. is clear yeah, your productivity has definitely got to be up. And I, I used to be probably the same as you, where you'd pat yourself on the back for having very little sleep and getting so much work done and hitting your personal best in the gym and out training and everybody. But you know that's catching up with you, you know. And now by incorporating, like you said, the hydrogen rich water, your intermittent fasting, the forms of hormesis, whether it come from exercise, heat, cold, whatever, it's going to have a much more beneficial effect on you physically, mentally. And from a productivity standpoint, for sure. And I, I've noticed that the absolute same, because the thing is, when you're down there with little sleep, you don't really recognize it. You think you're still being a warrior and getting more done than everyone else, but you're not. You know, internally, you're dragging ass, but you just don't want to admit it. it exactly. You know, and, and there's that, you know, like you said, that there's that pride, that, you know, machismo about, I only need three to four hours of sleep. Right. And you wear it as like a badge of honor. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, so many, you know, powerful people have bragged about how little sleep they've needed that we've already, we've created this culture, you know, where you should be proud of sleeping less, where really we should be teaching people to sleep better and sleep more. So we're more productive. And actually um, the one uh, trial that's starting in rodents um, in California is on homeostatic sleep function. Right. So they're going to sleep deprive, the mice and give them hydrogen and measure sleep quality. Interesting. Right. Yeah. That, that will be interesting to see. So when it comes to actually, you know, that the, you, you were the first person that actually told me the right information in regards to taking the hydrogen rich water. So uh, the, the tablets, sorry. So when I actually put these tablets in the water, I wait for them to float yeah, and yeah. then consume it. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll demo, you know, um, a little okay. bit. So, so um, everybody watching the YouTube, yeah. you'll be able to go in and actually see Alex uh, demo this. So I'm dropping them in. Um, now I dropped in the full strength ones. Yeah. Right? Uh, we have the raspberry ones also. That's what I you got know? the ra the full uh -huh. strength here. So I usually drink the full strength ones. I don't. I don't. You know, mind the taste. It's kind of like a kind of like a, a mineral water with lemon. It's, yeah you know, how I do it, but a lot of people like flavor, right? So these ones, the flavored ones have about half the hydrogen, right? But they're sweet, you know, like a pre-workout or, you know, soda or juice that a lot of people prefer. So we have that option too, but um, they start bubbling up right away. And what you want to do is as soon as they rise to the surface, you want to chug the water down. Now there's some research that shows that, um, say with gas inhalation, right? The same dose in a low dose continuous has no response. Whereas 
a high dose intermittent blast shows all these positive benefits. And if we consider the fact that we're creating, you know, eight, 10 liters of hydrogen gas a day through carbohydrate breakdown by our bacteria, right, through our, our digestive tract, it doesn't make sense why, you know, one tablet's making 70, 80 milliliters uh, of gas. Why does that 80 milliliters have such a profound benefit when we're already producing 10 liters, right? It's one of the, the big questions in, in the biochemistry. And it makes sense when you start thinking of it as, you know, the hormetic agent, you know, it's a blast of stress that triggers a response because the dose at that instant is so much higher than our body's accustomed to, right? Um, you know, because that 10 liters is throughout every moment of the day constantly. So we're blasting a higher rate in water. Now, in water too is shown to have a response at one one hundredth the volume as gas, right? So really this is like we're doubling the gas so the tablets just rose to the surface you want to chug it down yeah you can't waste it so i like doing it one shot you know just getting it all in me um but yeah that that's how you want to look at it that if you're I sipping it and even though the dosage says one tablet, you can put two tablets in you, there. You can put two. Um, we put one because our studies always use one, you know, in the water. I've anecdotally noticed a better response putting two, three, four, five. It might be better if you can drink more water to do one and then have a new glass and do one. Yeah. Right after. Um, because uh, the, the dissolution kinetics keeping gas in the water. It's not linear. Right. Basically, okay. So that's got to be much better than like dumping five in there possibly. Exactly. If you can drink more water, you know, but a lot of people don't want to drink two and a half liters chugging down right away. Most athletes can chug down half a liter. Yeah. You know, but you with, can do with, it intermittently, you know, like on the hour. Yep. Yeah. You, you can do that. Um, just make sure don't sip it. Right. Cause if you're sipping it, you're moving to that more continuous dose right? Yeah, it's that, not that, that maximum output. Exactly. Not to mention um, when the water is white, that's when we're getting, you know, the, the 10 PPM and 500 milliliters. If you wait five, six minutes, it's down to 1.6 PPM, right? Um, so we're kind of, um, we found some cool laws, you know, in physics and chemistry that's allowing us to get about seven times the dose that anyone else can get right? Because the maximum hydrogen that can be retained saturated in water under one atmosphere of pressure is 1.6 ppm or 1.6 milligrams a liter at, at, you know, SATP, which is normal, you know, temperature and pressure, right? Um, so by creating this, this constant stream of nanobubbles, nanobubbles obey different laws, and then they actually increase the internal pressure. And that's how we're getting about 10 ppm right? But it, it's stable enough to drink it down, but you can't just let it sit on the counter and go drink it 10 minutes later, mm. right? It's going to be down to 1.6. Yeah. Um, and to get that 10 PPM in another method, you need a hundred PSI of pressure, you know, and time for it to hit an equilibrium, right. which is what makes our, our technology really cool is it's really hard. You, you know, devices can't be made, you know, that, that, uh, uh get to that that psi right gaskets start blowing you know a lot of things start happening and actually you see this with a lot of the machines that try and go above about three ppm is even um, with thermoses double walled you know vacuum bottles in our testing we found they start blowing at about 35 40 psi right they start developing leaks start developing all these issues so all the machine manufacturers that are trying to go higher ppm are running into these massive roadblocks in engineering because they might get a higher PPM for a few uses, right? And then it falls down. And, you know, I, I know a lot about this because, you know, I actually have a, a pending patent on a device to use a tablet and we've gotten 11, 12, you know, PPM uh, of saturated water that's stable that you could sit up, sip on, but we aren't rolling it out because our units break after about 15 uses. And by break, I mean, they only 
make three, four PPM because everything above starts separating the gaskets and right. leaking out. Yeah, because that pressure. pressure. Got so it. we're still trying to overcome the engineering on this to make sure that you know this unit lasts more than 15 uses, right? At, at, at 120 PSI, that it can last years or indefinitely. Interesting, fascinating, because when I was using the device, I was using tablets at the same time, you know, yeah. so maybe I wasn't able to show that difference there. But with a lot of these tests, exactly what you were saying, because it wasn't only just me using this particular brand of machine, I knew of many others, because there was a group of people that were showing their uh, disgust, if you will, with that, that they'd invested so much. I think there was a, a like CNBC article that just came out this weekend. Oh, really? Oh, please send me a link to that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, because I know, you know, this group were trying to get this to the, the, the major press, and I, you know, I don't blame them. Uh, you know, a lot of people had invested in this. However, you know, yeah. with that machine, like you said, you know, what because people would look at the tablets as possibly being, you know, inferior. This machine that's going to cost 5,000 has got to be better, right? I think, I think they were charging 10,000 for the one, you know, that wasn't. Yeah, that's it for the higher end machine. Yeah, that, because that would pump out, that would have a, a, a pipe as well, so you could inhale the gas. And, and the that thing with that inhaled gas, I think it was like a 30, you know, milliliter a minute flow rate, which is about one-tenth what you'd want to see. Right. right. So their inhalation dose was like one tenth uh, of what you, you'd want to see in that. So it was just a big like inhaling that amount is, isn't going to have a therapeutic benefit. Right. OK. Yeah. Interesting. So with the tablets, like I, I always take these when I'm traveling, I'll, I'll be going to a military uh, base this weekend for, for a seminar there. I always take them when I'm traveling as well. So I'm going to follow this protocol. Like you said, now I'm going to change it. You know, so it's morning. Sometimes it's a bath once a week and I don't take it in my water during that time, kind of cycle this shock the body, give it a higher dosage. And uh, I'm going to report back that and I'll actually probably do a podcast and just cover the benefits that I encountered for now. Cause I've been taking it for a while, but not exactly as you just suggested. Uh, and I'm pretty obsessive and I play around and you know, there's over 1200 publications on hydrogen. There's 70 human trials. I've read every single human trial and I've read at least eight, 900, right. Of the, the 1200 studies. But on top of that, I talk to so many researchers in the field daily, right? Because we're working with, with nine different public universities teams right now on various trials on hydrogen. Um, I, I'm in, you know, daily communication with one of them, right? Like weekly communication with almost all of them. So I have dozens and dozens or hundreds of hours of talk time with the leading researchers in the area. So I piece together all this information and then I immediately try and put it to practice and recommend it to other people. So with this uh, changing up your dosing, it makes sense. We don't have the hard evidence for it, right? But it makes sense. The hypothesis is sound. And anecdotally, I found it works. And, you know, a few dozen people that I recommend to try it have said, oh, wow, like they've been taking hydrogen for a year or two. And you know, maybe their plateaus had benefited. And then as soon as they did a washout and changed their protocol, they're like, you know what? Like my knee loosened up a little bit more within a, a couple of days of changing the protocol, right? So I think there's something to it. We'd like to see more hard evidence on it, but that's going to come in time. Yeah. You know, the, the research is still green. You know, it's only 12 years since the seminal article. You know, and a lot of these these studies, like, you know, identifying, you know, responder versus non-responder can cost millions of dollars, right? Which uh, some of the grants that governments are giving are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they're not to the multi-center, you know, multi-million dollar trial, like genetic responder ones, uh, which is again, why we're trying to support public research rather than just private research. Because when we support public research, we donate product and then we donate some extra funds to make a better study you know, to test more markers, maybe enroll a few more participants or, you know, a few more mice and just that. Um, and we have no publication agreement with the researchers. So they're pursuing what interests them. Well, this then lets them show a better study 
and apply for more grant funds, right? To show, hey, look, you know, this is what's happened. We want a bigger grant to research this further. But if they're all just these tiny little studies, it's very hard to advance the science. So that's why we created our, our you know, research out, outreach program and started trying to support the public research. So they get behind hydrogen. It gets published in higher impact factor journals, spoken about at more academic conferences, and they can apply for bigger grant money to study more things so we can learn more and more and more about it. You know, learn more about dosing, genetic responders, how much should be taken when, right? And anything else that might come out of the research. Right. Okay. Interesting. So, uh, you know, what, what's going to be the next step here as well as that? Are, are you thinking about publishing a book on this? Because there's a lot of information. There's a lot of studies that's backing this up. And you're talking about, you know, how it can help with insulin sensitivity, obviously with possible arthritic conditions, with sleep, with performance benefits. There's a lot to cover and a lot to take in that requires something that's a little bit more detailed and manageable that people can actually apply dependence on that person and what they want to achieve from this. So uh, I, I do write a lot, you know, like I've got, you know, two or 300,000 words published on my blog, right? A lot of it is on hydrogen. Um, I put out one or two articles every week between, you know, 2000 to 10,000 words a week comes out. Um, I am actually working on a, a, a you know, a study or not a study, sorry, an article with a professor, you know, on a hypothesis I have on hydrogen. Another professor was invited to write a book for a major publisher and he wants a chapter on hydrogen and the hydrogen, like professors, researchers, like experts were too busy to do it. So I offered to write it. And so I'm writing it right now. It still has to get approved through referees, you know, and might be, changed a lot because of my conflict of interest on it but yeah no I, i'm trying to do as much as i can to spread my knowledge on it but also be changing my positions and knowledge as i'm talking to the researchers all the time you know i, I just got back from china in a few weeks and i had the opportunity to speak to several other researchers that i'd never spoken to so i'm always looking to, to gain knowledge and um, input from other researchers in different areas because all these experts on hydrogen have different specialties. So they're looking at it from a different angle, right? And, and that's all driving us to more knowledge to understand how it's working better. And that's again why, you know, so much of the research in hydrogen is all over the map. And even our studies are all over the map because every research team wants to research hydrogen to their interest, right? You know, because they think it's going to help their research topic. Right. And that really speaks to the, the potential wide application of hydrogen, just like the wide application of exercise. You know, it's in, in almost every protocol, you know, for pretty much every model it is improve your activity and you're going to improve your health. Right. right. And that's why we're seeing hydrogen has, has been explored and shown a benefit in 170 different models to date across every organ. Right. Okay. Well, I'd absolutely love to see a book from you because, uh, you know, I find it absolutely fascinating, not only for the people that, you know, the demographic that listens to my uh, podcast, but other people out there. Like the first thing I'm going to do is send a couple of bottles over to my father because he should have had a hip replacement about 11 years ago. But being as stubborn as he is, I'd love to see what his, you know, if he's a responder and what his feedback is. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the first things I did. I, I, you know, sent it to my, you know, grandma, you know, sent it, you know, to my parents. Uh, my mom has, a, you know, arthritis, you know, she's found it's helped her tremendously. Uh, my grandma's waiting on a hip, hip replacement. I mean, my grandma's 80 and she still, you know, puts step ladders on top of, you know, the, the patio table to try and clean the gutters. You know? <laughs> but, you know, she she's said it's helped her mobility and energy you, you know she's called it an elixir you know um and, and honestly like we we see the biggest response the more damage someone has the, the better the rescuing effect right um so in vitro hydrogen you know working by this rescuing effect if you take a perfectly healthy cell and you put it in a hydrogen rich medium typically you see nothing there's no changes no benefit whatsoever now you artificially damage those cells, 
and you see all the markers changing because hydrogen is going to work rescuing all the damage, right? Um, and say with athletes, perhaps, you know, amateur athletes would actually see a statistically bigger benefit, but they're less in tune with their body, right? right they, yeah. they don't notice that benefit, right? I've found elite athletes have immediately noticed for the most part, the benefits of hydrogen because they're so in tuned with what their body can do. Of course. Yeah. Right. You know, that, that even the slight improvement is huge to them. You know, yeah. it's like we talked about um, when you're pushing in different directions, right. Even if you're within, you know, an inch in two directions, it might be impossible to go both inches at the same time in, in both ways. Cause if you go here, you're moving away from there. So a lot of these guys performing to their body's maximum are seeing this slight improvement and it's just blowing their minds. Yeah, for sure. And because we quantify everything as well, yeah. you know, so we're measuring everything. If we see that slight improvement, we've measured it and we're going to notice it. Exactly. And I mean, uh, to, to go into again, like what we saw in like that, uh, um, the O2 max chest test study, you know, when I was still, you know, trying to compete in CrossFit and uh, I was in a, a high intensity interval training program that it wasn't CrossFit, but I actually found it helped me with CrossFit better than just doing CrossFit. So I was doing CrossFit beyond CrossFit, if that <laughs> makes sense, cross training beyond CrossFit. Um, and it wouldn't improve my counts in circuit one. Like say for instance, the train would be 12 stations of different movements, 40 seconds on, 40 seconds off of as high intensity you could go. You know, when you're counting your reps, whether it's a sledgehammer or uh, burpee to bar muscle ups, you know, like, or, or, you know, various things like sled pushes, my numbers had no improvement round one, but they did round two, three, four, the more tired I would have been getting, the more my numbers were staying. Right. You know? and, and I've heard that, you know, from a lot of distance athletes, like, you know, even, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, common law girlfriend, it won't help her, you know, doing like a fast track time, right. Might not even does, she doesn't even really notice a difference in say like a 5k, but she sure does in a marathon. She can keep her pace, you know, faster and a lot better. Right. Okay, great. I, I know a top, a couple of top triathletes here as well. I might give them some as well to try out. And uh, I'd love to know their response as well, because you know they're always trying to get that little bit of edge, uh, usually spending uh, a couple of thousand dollars on a, on a new wheel or something in order to do so. I, I wish I could tell you um, some of the world-class athletes that are taking the tablets right now, but you know I can't really divulge customer information you know without a contract and specific yeah makes sense of course. endorsement yeah but, I know. Um, there is a lot of household names that are, are taking it, you know, as their little secret. That's awesome. That's great. Well, hopefully it won't become such a secret uh, much longer. So Alex, thank you ever so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate this. Like I feel that we've only just scratched the surface and uh, you know, people that follow me, uh, keep an eye out on my socials, especially my Insta stories, where I will actually start reporting what I find with this new protocol that I'm going to start trying uh, with, 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 the, with the hydrogen rich water. So where can people find you? If people to interact or people want to find more content from you in regards to this, uh, we'll put the links, all yeah. the links in so the we'll, show we'll notes. Put the links to the, the, the blog and the show notes and, you know, link to, you know, we'll do a special yeah. offer for your listeners. Too. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. So we'll put the link in there and obviously you will have a blog. If people want to keep up to date on all the research and findings and the content that you're putting out there, they will put a link to that as well. Exactly. I mean, we have everything like, uh, it's been called by some of the researchers, even, you know, our comparing H2 technologies article, it's about 5,000 words. And some of the researchers have called it the most, you know, comprehensive comparison. You know, and I often get complimented from researchers on how neutral I remain. You know, even with claims, you know, in, in the research, um, my marketing team often gets pretty upset with me because I'll downplay studies, even studies on our own tablet and say, now we need to know this or this. But that's the only way we can really expand knowledge. 
You know, if I go start screaming that this is a miracle and it's going to cure everyone of everyone, researchers aren't going to take it seriously. And that's going to really hurt the industry, but the population also. If, you know, the trend continues and all these benefits continue to be documented in the research and, and you know, through the population, we need to be working with public scientists. They don't want to be affiliated with something that seems like quackery or a scam. Right? They want to deal with legitimate companies that care about science and care about knowledge. Right? So, you know, I almost will not sell, you know, push away from the benefits to be conservative because that's the only way to build the foundation, right? To get real positive attention from the research community so we can know more and more about hydrogen and how it helps. Right. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much again, once again, Alex. And uh, as Alex mentioned, there's a special. So do check the link in the show notes for that. And uh, I'll be putting up a lot of my latest findings on my Insta stories here. So keep an eye out. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today. No problem. Um, likewise, it was a pleasure. And you have a great day. And I look forward to seeing the stories. All right. Thank you.